Inside Commercial Property with Rethink Investing. Australia's largest and most comprehensive podcast covering all things commercial investing. Hi, good everyone. How are you going? Uh, Phil Tarrant here, co-host of Inside Commercial Property uh, with the informed Scott O'Neill, director of Rethink Investing. Scott, how are you going? How informed are you today? Oh. More informed by the minute? Oh, yeah. Year <laughs> after year, it all adds up, doesn't it? You think so. There's, there's this big thing around um, uh, knowledge and wisdom, right? Like, how do you get sort of commercial property wisdom? Just plenty of scar tissue, no doubt. Yeah, just, oh, I think doing it, to be honest. Like, mm. there's, you can have all the theory in the world, but until you're, uh, you know, got a property in your face and mm. going through it and dealing with, uh, dodgy tenants or an agent just trying to get a sale over the line like it all yeah all the theory in the world can fly out the window sometimes so as a backstory for um uh, your business rethink investing you, you essentially kicked off just as a property investor yourself and it's a bit of a backstory that people might not know about you uh, you're an engineer by trade by memory weren't you yeah, yeah so engineer and um i moved into i did that for a couple of years building railways and that then moved mm. into like the aggregates and sand mine type industry, concrete production. Okay. So that took me to regional Australia, um, which was good for property really because uh, I ended up buying some regional properties while I was uh, working in these areas. Mm. And um, yeah, it was just, it was very, I guess, related to commercial property because we were managing mine sites and dealing with leases and we'd got, you know, concrete plants have leases to private investors and obviously you've got to deal with all the maintenance and the, uh, the law around leases when you're uh, – renting yourself so Mm. a lot of my clients are actually uh you know they're renting commercial properties themselves so they've got that kind of relatable barrier uh that's broken down for them so Mm. i was investing in commercial property i was a residential investor first like like most people but found the yields were just not really hitting the numbers we wanted to so i uh, i was always a high yield property investor Mm. because i wanted to build a passive income i used to be able to do it a lot easier with residential and yields just weren't up to scratch at some point. So commercial, I remember I did about 18 months of research before I bought my first commercial. Okay. And, you know, As a resi investor, so yeah. yeah. And I was just honestly a little bit fearful of it like most people. And mm-hmm. I, I'd, people were saying, oh, don't do it, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I just researched and researched and, you know, spoke to hundreds of agents and just I enjoyed it. So that helped do that extra time, I guess. And then finally bought one. And since then, never looked back because, yeah, the yields were, when you look at it from a net cash flow point of view, it's it's at least triple times mm. the cash flow. So that helped me build a retirement income or a retirement grade income very quick and ended up quitting the job. Went to Europe for six months, didn't do too much. And, uh, you know, people were sort of wondering what the hell I was doing. So you were sort of semi-retired. You went, that's it. I've, so, yeah. so as an engineer, you were able to generate enough income to start investing in property and then you pivoted into commercial property to create an income for yourself. So you went, yeah. that's it. And, and look, at the time I was I was 28 and it was 190 grand passive income. Is that so, what you're generating? So, it's not bad. And nowadays it's over 450. Okay. So we definitely work by choice and, mm. and I will continue to do this because, uh, yeah, I love it. And mm. initially the business was just to stay connected to the market because um, – you know, obviously, when you, you you'd know yourself, when you're looking at properties, you get very connected whilst you're looking. And then, mm. what if you don't buy for two years? You forget the market. You then got to work out where the hot spot is and what the yields are. And it takes a lot of time. And it was just not efficient to drop off the face of the earth. So, helping others was a kind of a nice little sideline thing in between my own purchases. And fast forward a uh, number of years, rethink um, has grown into a very Biz, you know, we're, we're buying sort of 20 million a month in commercial mm. property in all price points. And yeah, it's, it's every property is different. That's the good thing. It's, it's fresh. And mm. um, yeah, that's sort of why we do what we do. Yeah, that's a good story. And, um, you know, it's in- interesting. I, I, I get to chat with a lot of property investors and then property investors that turn into property professionals. There's some reason it's a, it's a rite of passage, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's just typically every single person working in property started as a, purchase a property investor or something or other, right? That's where yeah. it all begins. You have to do something. And like every one of my clients actually already know this. They go, well, if I get my goal of, uh, ret- you know, my 200 grand passive income or whatever their goal is, mm. they already know they want to work. You know, this whole idea of not working, it's, uh, it depends on your age, of course, and what's going on. But I haven't met many people that don't want to do something. It's yeah. just having the choice to do something different, you know, instead of uh, if you're an accountant and you hate, you know, working long accountancy hours, maybe you can do something else, you know, like mm. 
you know, run an Airbnb company or do something a little bit more part-time. You've got to do something. I, and, and I agree. Um, people that I know who are successful have worked hard still do something and they have to do it. Otherwise, they get all agitated, right, and jerky and, and yeah. they can't like – you've you, got to be productive yeah you Absolutely. need your purpose if yeah. you don't have a purpose what's what's the point mm. so you keep connected now with are you still investing personally yourself you're always out there looking yeah so we're, we're in the middle of building a house so once that's completed because mm. that, that's a two-year job yeah we'll be back into it and uh my my sort of next steps with investing probably going to do larger assets because i've got lots of uh small to medium-sized ones so mm. i like the idea of uh having less but higher quality just because it's less clutter yeah yeah, I'm sort of finding that with my portfolio now where I just go, oh, I just don't want to deal with some of this yeah. stuff anymore. Like I don't care that a vanity's leaking or, or whatever. I just go, oh, I, don't, I feel like getting smaller. And I think yeah. that's a, a journey for most property investors, right? Yeah. Or you just start being a lot more specific and and uh, and, and picky with the assets that you choose. And now I'm going bigger. So when you talk about um, the next phase for you, that will be – 100% commercial or you still do some resi stuff? Yeah, oh, look, I've done my time with resi. Like mm. residential was great. You know, I was buying like unit blocks and duplexes and, you know, just, just plain old houses in growth mm. areas and they've done well. Uh, but for where I'm at, like it's not about just sitting waiting for growth anymore. I'd rather just uh, have a, a more efficient portfolio which looks after itself. And when yeah. you've got bigger, better tenants, like multinational tenants, they're normally just a direct setup with uh, the rent just comes in for 12 months, you don't hear anything. And uh, at the same time, you've got really good quality tenants, which probably will stay 10, 20 years as well. Mm. And that's more attractive to me at this point of time because, it, you know, I'm not, like you said, I don't want to be dealing with little, you know, businesses outgrowing their, their space too quick or, uh, you know, a house where the, the tenant's having problems or, the, you know, they've got a divorce. So you don't want to be part of that at mm. some point. But it's a rite of passage as you well. You have to do that though because yeah. that's your foundational portfolio and you wouldn't be doing what you did today if you didn't do what you did when Correct. you did it, right? You have to have to start off small yeah. um, or a lot of people, if they've got a very like good business or mm. a big income there, yeah, maybe you can jump into the deep end straight up. But, yeah. you know, it's all, all relative at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and and you're talking about now you've got a lot of sort of small to medium stuff commercial. You're talking about the next stuff will be a bit larger. How large are you thinking? You're talking like shopping centre type stuff? Maybe shopping centres, so sort of over three, three to five mil yep. will be what I'll be looking at in uh, in the next few years, mm. and um, probably I'll, I will sell down portfolios as well. Like I've got at least ten houses that I, you know, I want to see Brisbane do its thing. Like well, they're everyone. talking about it. Have you seen it? Yeah. You just got to pick up your social media feed now. Everyone's talking about yeah. 10, 20, 30 percent increase in Brisbane. Thankfully, about time, right? So if we get that, then yeah. uh, that'll be a catalyst to um, recycle some money from there into another type of investment. Mm. So yeah, probably just reduce the number of properties. I currently own thirty two, yeah. and I don't want thirty two anymore. You don't so, need it. No, no, I'd rather ten good size ones than, or even five really good size ones mm. than. 32. It's just it's more long term, really. Yeah. And if you've got like a succession strategy with this, you're going to sell the lot and, and go and like travel around Europe for the. Oh, the rest of your no, life I'll point. keep running this business. So yeah. like rethink investing. It's, um, yeah, love it. So yeah, it's good. Yeah. And no. like we've got a place in Europe. So we, we have always done our two to three months overseas, except for 2020 because mm. of dear old COVID. So yeah. that um, put that on hold. But, you know, we'll. we'll continue to do that yeah interesting and and you know i wanted today's uh chat scott and thanks just for a bit of a backstory for those uh of our listeners that aren't familiar with you um you know and, and you can ask any property investor and there'll always be some narrative to how they ended up getting where they are today and then most investors i know are always thinking about the future as well right whether it's a sell down or buy more or change the, the profile of the portfolio but um one of the questions that we've had over uh, the last couple of weeks scott there's been a number of them around lease stock loans so you know that's a, a mechanism for getting people into commercial if they are a bit more of a sophisticated investor and don't want to deal with a lot of the crap. So uh, I want to do a bit of a and a session today, uh, that being one of the questions. Uh, there's also some questions around building insurance uh, and some other things. But um, I'll kick off our Q&A session. And remember, get in contact with us. If there's anything you'd like to ask us, we can answer them on air and, and pretty much anything. Scott can handle anything. You're not scared of any question, are you, mate? Oh, it depends. <laughs> What's best? Where, where, where can people send their questions best, please? Um, probably just info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. That's our sort of general info or email. So, um, yeah, we'll always get back to any question. Brilliant. And we've got a question here, Scott, from uh, Jesse Sandor uh, by email. So, um, 
Thanks for writing in, uh, Jesse. And I'll read the whole thing out. It's a bit long, so just be patient, but it gives a bit of a story. It says, uh, G'day, gents. Just wanted to drop your quick line and thank you for creating a podcast tailored to commercial property. Uh, this is something we, the investor community, will be missing. Well, thank you. It's good to know it's resonating. Jesse continues, you mentioned you may do a Q&A episode of them. Want, wanted to run something past Scott. Okay, here we are. I am an avid property investor. My wife and I started building our residential property portfolio in her early 20s, and we are very happy with where it is now, just 10 years into our investing journey. Uh, we've built a property portfolio of 16 properties, not a bad size portfolio. Only two of these are commercial, and both of the commercial properties are for our business. Uh, this leads to my question. Why, as a business owner, would you rent instead of purchase uh, as soon as your cash flow or position would allow? I understand why this may not be the case for publicly listed companies or large organizations, but if we are talking about property sub $2 million and you lease this property, why wouldn't you buy it uh, when you knew the strength of your own business? Am I looking at this too much? Is that just my thought process because I've been a herd uh, towards property from a young age? I'm keen to keep learning more about commercial property from your podcast and appreciate the knowledge you are putting out. As a long-term listener to Smart Property Investment, this compliments amazingly well. Keep up the good work. Uh, Thanks, Jess. Uh, Thanks, Jess. Thanks for writing in. All really cool. Uh, Sounds like Jess um, and his wife are on that same journey. Most property investors are. They've gone down beefing up a residential portfolio and then going, well, something's just not quite right here. Often that's a yield thing, right? Yeah, so yield or lending capacity mm. and also just diversity. Like if you've got 10 residential properties, it's sort of a bit wise to try something else, mm. you know. It's like uh, you don't go all in on a bank share. If you've got a portfolio of shares, you go, you spread it around. So it shouldn't be any different for property, I don't think. And yeah, to answer that question, it's it's very common. I get a lot of business owners go, oh, why don't I buy? Because it's cheaper to buy. The main thing is flexibility, you're putting more capital into the one location. So imagine you've got your business and all your money tied up in a property. There's yeah. a lot of risk in one pool. If you're a newish business, you may grow too quick, which might mean you need to uh, rent a different space. You know, you don't keep buying your spaces as you grow. You need to, uh, you know, it's the rent investor story. Like it's very similar to residential. Like I, I think I'm a big believer of I like to buy the forever home when you can. Don't trade up three times. Don't buy the two-bedroom unit. Don't buy the three-bedroom townhouse. Rent those Mm. so you don't pay stamp duty two or three times on the way and pay sales commission on the way out. So same thing with a business. If you know you're going to be in the one location for a very long time, yeah, it probably makes sense to purchase. But at the same time, if you put that same money into another property somewhere else to create a passive income, it's almost like hedging your bets. You know, you put your money to create an income which you could cycle back into the business if you really need to or you know you're basically allowing yourself a safety net if your business doesn't do well because your property is separate to that if your business slows up because in five years there's another pandemic or something totally unforeseen you wouldn't want to uh be sitting in there you've got no income coming through your business and then a mortgage you know it's nice to kind of spread it around so flexibility it's just the rent money is only dead money if you don't invest somewhere else. Mm. No, that's the key. If you if you're sitting that money in a bank and you haven't invested it, yeah, sure, it's probably better to to buy it, but but invest it somewhere else, make a revenue out of it through a different source. And that's just my personal choice. Uh, you know, we rent our office versus buying it. Or, you know, it's that's what most people do. It's mm. um, sometimes you can put more money back into the business. You can get an active. 30% return on your business revenue for some some businesses, that's better than getting an 8% return off a of property. Yeah. Um, so putting your money into the business could be another option alternatively to uh, buying it. Yeah, it's it's a really good question, Jesse, and um, you know, you, you make a point here, are you sort of overthinking it? I don't think you are. I think it's, it's a smart business decision to stress test this. Smart Property Investment, we work with Scott to deliver the Inside Commercial Property podcast. Um, that, that's part of the Momentum Media Group, which is sort of a large sort of information media business. That business rents its its premises, um, which we're recording from. We've got a studio in it right now, a couple of floors in, in North Sydney. We couldn't buy where we are right now because it's owned by a large institution. So a lot of the times you you can't buy the premises that you operate within. We want to be in North Sydney. We want to be uh, located uh, where we are right now, good offices. There's only a handful of strata buildings in North Sydney where you could actually buy your premises 
and they're not particularly nice. Yeah. You know, or they're a little bit too far out of the CBD. So often, depending on your type of business, you can't actually buy. You can't actually buy the place. You have to rent. Uh, otherwise, you need to change uh, where you operate. But it also depends, I think, Scott, on what type of business you are and, and how geographically connected it is. So if you have a gym, your gym probably only needs to be so big. So you've probably got a lot of confidence in buying a location, be on a high street somewhere with large foot traffic where you need to dominate that local domain. So therefore, you've probably got a lot more way to balance the scale and the speed at which your business grows if you have a gym. Yeah. Same again if you're a real estate agent. You know, you probably want to get certainty that you can control that local high street by owning that premises rather than getting booted out and then putting the boost juice in. So I think there's these are a lot of the things you really need to consider, right? Exactly. And look, even with that gym example, you might, yes, buying it, it could be a good option, but instead of putting $2 million into that, maybe they buy $2 million worth of equipment, expand to another location. So mm. it's it's a very personal business choice and that's um, you can never generalise it. Yeah. Often business owners buy their business premises because their accountant tells them to, right? Like this is, I hear this all the time. Uh, my accountant said, set up a self-managed super fund and buy your, your business residence in it. I was only listening to a podcast the other day and um, I had Matt Moran who, uh, for those of you who probably know him, he's quite a famous, well-known chef. He went through the process of renting his locations, but then, you know, talking about the nature of his business is that their, their experience-based businesses and location is absolutely critical. So, you know, as and when they got to a point where they could, they started buying the real estate where the restaurant was based so they could ensure that they could control that experience through location. So this is another uh, way that would be extrapolated out, but it's very different for everyone. Would you err on the side of caution as a, a sort of growing business and, and not buy? Yeah, I, look, especially a growing business, mm. I, I think flexibility is is key. I, I've always value that as a business if you are if you tie yourself into a location when you're growing you might need a larger spot and yeah. what if the neighbor came up in a better position around the corner facing the harbor and you can rent that you know all of a sudden you don't want to own the property you'd rather the flexibility yeah it's a tough one um hopefully that uh, helps jess um what what would you do any recommendations to to help make these decisions whether you know buy where you are or or rent where you need to be and invest your money elsewhere? Who do you talk to other than someone like yourself? Yeah. Oh, look, it's hard, but talk to your spreadsheet. Yeah. Put it. Um, put the investing column there versus purchasing versus, uh, you know, all the costs associated with each decision and then look at the business growth. It's You, you really just got to know your business. So mm. I think you'll answer it at the end of the day, but just talk to a number of professionals and hopefully uh, – you'll average it out and make your own decision. Hopefully uh, that helps. Uh, questions like that, remember info at reefinginvesting.com.au. We can answer these questions. Uh, Scott, there's another question here, and, and we spoke about this briefly, I think it was last podcast. We had a discussion with uh, one of your clients. Bardia. There yep. you go. Uh, right. Gyms and pharmacies, right? And uh, talking about lease stocks. Um, and we've had a whole bunch of questions in, so I won't sort of read them out specifically, but aggregated or people are going, hey, I like, I like the idea of this lease stock loan. I didn't really understood them or knew they existed. How do they work? How do you get it? Why would you Why would you choose that particular type of loan and what's the upside benefit of it? Yeah, look, we got smashed with questions on this lease stock scenario. So it must be something not many people have heard of, mm. but, you know, for us commercial investors, it's, it's yeah, it's a day-to-day -day thing. So lease stock loans are really important if you've hit a serviceability limit with your portfolio so a lot of people might have like i said 10 properties and their lending is kind of hitting uh its last legs so rather than not buy it you can actually do a lease stock loan and mm -hmm. what that is is it's a loan on the property for a commercial without looking at your financials so uh basically a strong commercial property will lend on itself and that's the difference. Residential properties always need someone paying it off because uh, there's not never enough certainty with the rent. But if you buy a good quality property in commercial, it'll pay itself off. And the banks recognize that and they'll give you a loan without citing the ins and outs of your finances. So it's a lot quicker to get a loan. It's uh, it's something that I personally like because you know, I've got a lot of loans. Sometimes it's easier just to do a loan on the side. And then, yeah, you can refinance it later into a, a full doc loan if you mm. want, but but you, sometimes you don't need to. So I'll give you some some numbers. So the LVRs for a lease doc are normally around 65% on average. 
Loan terms can be up to 25 years, so beyond the current lease. So a lot of people think it's only on the lease itself, which can be the case. It depends on the lender. So imagine you've bought a property, it's got a five-year lease on it, but you've got 25 years on the length of the lease. It's um, it's almost like a set and forget type scenario. Mm. So interest rates can be fixed. The lowest rates I've heard are around that kind of 37 four percent type average but yeah good rates there's some higher versions if you go to a higher lvr the banks can sometimes uh ask for a quicker pay down to get to the lower lvr over a certain period of time so there's options there the length of the lease on the property must be at least 12 months if it's Mm. less than that well you wouldn't probably want to buy it anyway but you know you can get a loan on a 12 month lease Lease stock loans have got to be done with an spv which is a special purpose vehicle set up so that's a trust or a company so i haven't seen many lease stocks under your personal name you've got mm. to set it up under a trust but most people buying in a commercial property will have that set up anyway because you're dealing with large sums of revenue so sometimes there's uh efficiency with a trust because you can delegate income to certain people you can you know there's land tax benefits and all that kind of stuff yeah but like i said they don't look at your financials so they don't look at pay slips and if you've got bad credit they won't probably give you the loan. So they Mm. will still do a basic search on you. Like if you've got clouds over you and, you know, the bank doesn't have any confidence, you won't just guarantee to get a lease stock. So there's still conditions. But look, as long as the deal makes sense, the banks will lend to you. That's the key. So it's all about the property. You know, commercial lending is a non-regulated space. So, you know, what that means is the bank will go out and look at the lease vacancy rate. So type of asset, type of location, so banks will prefer certain good quality properties over the lower quality ones. So I've found they love warehouses at the moment because the whole industry is very strong at the moment. But if you're trying to buy it retail in a regional area, it's probably going to be harder to get a lease stock. But it's all case by case. Mm. And do all banks do lease stock loans or is only sort of a handful of them or more second tier lenders or non-major banks? Uh, look, I don't think they all do it, but I know majors and second tier do it. Mm. So they've all got their different variances. You know, there's a number of banks out there. Like I've, I've, I'm hearing at least five different types of banks doing this stuff at the moment. And, you know, and, and yeah, like it's it's common. Like mm. we're, I'd probably say one out of four of my clients are doing a lease stock at the moment. So it is preferable to get a full doc loan if you can because yeah. your interest rates are going to be in the low twos at the moment. So. Okay, so you pay a, a big premium in order to have a lease stock loan. Yeah, yeah, relatively big, mm. uh, and that's why it could be good to set it up at like three point seven percent interest rate. It's pretty good if you're getting a seven percent net return. So yeah. you're still highly positively geared no matter what you do. However, you might get the loan, sit on it for twelve months, then refinance casually later when you mm. can. So you're not stuck with the lease stock forever. But it's a means to get into the property at the right time with the less stress. Mm. And is it cyclical, people using lease stocks and not using lease stocks? Do you think sort of all this COVID stuff and maybe people had a, a challenging 2020, 2021 financially, they'll be sort of going to this sort of stuff? I think it is really to do with residential lending. So mm. the harder residential lending is, the more likelihood you would want a lease stock. So remember like, what was it, 2018, they brought APRA to tighten the reins on investor lending Mm. for residential. So all of a sudden, lease stock loans became much more prominent because people couldn't get loans. So Mm. this is a way, you just need a cash deposit or equity, like you still need that part of it. Yeah, so So 65% means like a million dollar property, you've got to pony up a fair bit of money, right? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's not a game for, you know, your your guys with 50 grand deposits. Mm. This, you've got to have larger sums, but, you know, when you're talking about guys that have tapped out of residential lending, they can have, you know, a million or so in equity. So, uh, you know, as long as they've got access to that, then this can be a quick way of getting a loan. And how do you go about doing it? Do you just call out your broker and say, I need a lease stock loan? Yeah, look, it's... Or will they tell you what to do? Oh, it depends on if they're doing this often. So mm. it's a specialist type commercial loan. So you generally want a mortgage broker who's good with commercial loans. If you go to your someone who's never done this, they'll learn on the job, which is fine. But, you know, there's there's some go-to banks that pop up and yeah they're the ones you want to go to depending on you know what's getting through the easiest with the banks mm. you know what, what do you think so many people ask us the question what's this lease stock stuff do you reckon people are struggling like is that an indicator for us saying more and more people are being are more interested in commercial lending however it looks like they don't have the capacity to get a more 
traditional commercial loan. Is that an indicator for us? Yeah, look, uh, I was surprised how, like it's probably the thing that came out more than any particular topic we've spoken mm. about. So I, I think it's just the idea that you don't have to submit all your financials. You know, like if you've got, you know, 10 different properties, that's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. And um, it's, yeah, it's a pain to it's go a through. It's nightmare. Yeah. So an absolute nightmare. People like shortcuts. This is just a classic shortcut, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, um, Go and speak to your broker. If you've got any more questions around this, Scott's happy to, to have a chat with you offline. Um, but you just Google it as well. You should be able to learn a whole bunch of lease docs. But it's good to be aware. You know, A lot of people, like residential, Scott, they get fixated by the property itself. But just like residential lending, commercial lending is a game of finance as well, right? It's being able to secure the property for and hold it for as cheap as possible yep. and generate as much income as you can off it. You know, and this is one of the myths, though, and, and you spoke about commercial properties being higher yielding and, and therefore delivering a more likely outcome of having a positively geared portfolio. Most people think that comes at the expense of capital growth, but we've had a chat about this before and that's not the, that's not the case, is it? Yeah, oh, look, I'd be – the capital growth we're seeing at the moment would easily be beating the best of residential with a few little exceptions. Mm. It's because – just depends on where, like the office market is not shooting through the roof, you know, but like industrial and like medical type properties and it's just the sheer lack of stock on the ground versus increased demand through interest rate cuts, through people revisiting their strategy to go, all right, I need better cash flow, commercials, a bit of a go-to at the moment. So yeah, growth is, is happening almost quicker than we want to keep up in some areas and, mm. you know, what that means is, Properties that were showing seven, eight percent returns last year are now sort of six and a half, and now we've got to adjust our expectations. It's like buying in Sydney, where the average price for your suburb might have been one point two million, and now you've got to pay one point three. You know, it's like it's hard to go. Oh God, it seems expensive, and but that's the way it's going. So it's all supply demand, like everything else. It doesn't matter if it's commercial or residential. If the supply is not keeping up with the demand, it will grow. A lot of the commentary and while we're talking about uh, interest rates uh, sorry lease stock loans are highly connected with interest rates whenever the rba makes a decision on rates and you know for the last couple of years has always been down we're sort of 0.1 percent or something like now or one percent yeah zero yeah, point zero point one percent is the current rba interest rate that doesn't mean that's you know most people are still paying two threes fours percents on their resi mortgages but when you look at uh, asset classes in Australia, residential property is the biggest by a long way. It's like what, six trillion bucks mm. or something else worth. Uh, followed, there's a quite a big gap by, I believe, self-managed super funds and then industry and retail funds. So superannuation. And then you, I think you have value in the ASX, so listed securities. And then there's commercial property, I think. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but by memory, that's about the order of stuff. So commercial property as an asset class isn't necessarily where most Australians park their wealth. That's where some Australians park their wealth. So what typically happens is that when the RBA makes an announcement around interest rates, everyone goes, oh, what does it mean for residential property? Are my interest rates going to be cheaper on my mortgage? And then there's always a discussion around what it will mean for retirement, superannuation, all this stuff. So commercial property never gets on the radar. Can you give me some sense for the marriage between the decisions made by the RBA and how that flows into changes in your interest rate on a commercial loan? No one ever talks about this stuff. No, is that the same? Look, yeah, and it's it's actually when Melbourne Cup passed and that mm. cut was uh, implemented, that killed about oh, at least five deals for us. So what happened was we, we had offers on the table. They were literally verbally accepted. And then that cut happened and then owners go, well, I want more money, you know, because where am I going to park my money now? Like mm. even though it's an irrationally small amount of change, it's the sentiment that a cut drives into the market and it just made people a little bit more greedy from the uh, sales point of view. So we we lost deals because they wanted more money, and we, like, and you know, there was one that we had it locked away at one point seven. He wanted one point nine. Like that's like it, obviously there's no math that backs that up, but it's still it just shows how sentiment still is in the commercial market, and owners just get second thoughts of selling. And mm. um, Obviously, it helps us investors. You know, if you can lend at a cheaper rate, you know, you can justify lending more or taking a smaller rent roll but pay more for it. Like it, it all kind of flows through similar to residential, but if anything, it's probably a little bit more sensitive because the value of commercial property is dictated off the net yield. So, and that's also the net after your mortgage. So, if mm. your mortgage is cheaper, you can pay more. And that's kind of what happens. So, prices, uh, 
will grow and that's the most instant impact that owners want more and it's not all cases that was just a number of ones we were kind of halfway through negotiating on you know because you know we lost power as investors and then the next stage is people can get better rates and then that'll mean they'll pay more and that'll just flow slowly through to the market mm. so the banks do pass on the interest rate savings into commercial loans like they do residential oh case by case, case, by yeah. case yeah. yeah yeah you and, normally yeah. can just go go ask your bank like you know maybe form it as a bit of a overall refinance strategy mm. to say look i want certain rates so everything is a little bit more flexible with yeah. commercial it's not it doesn't have the same box checks uh that residential will so yeah it reminds me i've got to call up all my banks and say after that i've been spoken to them since that November rate cut saying, I haven't even looked at whether my rates have changed. I doubt they have. No. They don't normally banks don't normally change your rates unless you ask them. So no. get on the phone and do that. But that's a really interesting point. So let's just break down the vendor wanting more money. So they're pretty much going, I was going to sell it at one point seven, now on one one point nine. And they're saying because if I sell it at one point seven, the utility of that money isn't as good as what it is now. Because if they're going to go and chuck that in a some sort of cash product they're getting a lot less interest on it. Yeah. So and, that's the logic, is it? And what the other side to it is, you know, a lot of these were sales that have caused from COVID. So mm. people were like, oh, I don't know what's going on with the economy. Maybe I'll just sell because I'll get a good price. But now that's passed. Like most parts of Australia feel very good with the economy compared to what they were doing six months ago. Mm. So interest rate cut, better looking economy, what would you sell? So their expectations grow with the improved confidence. So that's happened a few times. It's hard and that's why stock's low. You know, there's there's not a real great reason to sell unless you're upsizing or maybe you're putting money back into a business or maybe you're trying to square off your last debt for retirement or maybe mm. there's a divorce and you've got to, put, you know, split your assets. Like there's all sorts of scenarios. But in general, people aren't selling just for the sake of it. There's got to be a reason. So not selling because they're distressed and that was one of the reasons why the banks put that those um, home loan holidays on, right, to stop people having to flood the market with property. And I was reading the other day, I think 70% of all jobs lost during COVID are back now. So, you know, the economy's doing pretty well. But, um, yeah, interesting. Go and speak to a good broker. They should be able to help you out with all this. But financing, getting it right is um, is absolutely critical. Well, Scott, we'll go to another a question here. And um, this is the alias of this person is anonymous. So they didn't give us their name, but we'll just call them Fred for the sake of Fred, Fred asks, <laughs> on a commercial property, who pays for the building insurance? This is, this is an important question, and this is about sort of outgoings and stuff, right? So if we expand that out into uh, the cost to run a commercial property is borne by largely or increases is borne by the tenant. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's always in the lease document. So mm-hmm. outgoings are not consistent across the board so you've got to read the lease the lease will say 100 percent of outgoings but sometimes say excluding special levies mm. or excluding building insurance so leases contradict themselves and this is where you need to to look over it carefully you know if you find that you have to pay the insurance on a, on a building that could be four grand out of your cash flow per annum which means you've overpaid for the property if you factored in a certain yield so review your lease document and then yeah obviously i always get quotes to make sure that the insurance quoted on the IM is fair because, mm. you know, it's easy to tone down the uh, the value of that building insurance to uh, benefit the, the seller. So you've got to just check those things. But most properties are, like I'd say probably 90% of them, the tenant will pay your building insurance. So what happens is you as a landlord take the building insurance out. This is for a freestanding asset. Mm. And then you invoice the tenant once you've paid it because you've got to put the insurance under your name. And then you send it to your tenant or let your rental manager send the invoice, paid invoice as a, you know, you're basically recouping the money the next month. Mm. So it, it will get paid. Strata holds the building insurance generally. So tenants will pay Strata in most cases as well. So building insurance is a big part of Strata, especially for like warehouses. Stratas are simple. You know, there's no lifts. There's barely any common area besides, you know, some concrete hall road or bitumen road. Mm. So, yeah, your, your building insurance is a big part of it. So you want to check it's all valid. You want to check the total sum insured, who the company is. And, yeah, that's building insurance is generally a tenant's cost. Yeah, in something like a larger, like a office block like we're in right now, um, I think our lease, it's, we pay a percentage of the increase in outgoings. So it's not all outgoings. Um, so it'll change depending on who 
who the landlord is, right? Yeah, so percentage breakdown is a, a common way. So if you're part of a, a group title or mm. strata, it's basically, you know, you might pay 10% of the total outgoings. Mm. It might even be averaged out each year and you just, you've got an out, you know, a predicted allocation of it. Um, again, lease stocks all vary. So mm. you never go in and just assume that's what happens. Even if the agent's IM information memorandum says that that's what they're paying because it might actually conflict with the advice given to the agent. Yeah. And when people sort of get into commercial investing, do they often get confused about these sort of holding costs? Because it's probably the, the, the fundamental difference between residential and commercial is that you got to pay for most, you got to pay for the insurance in residential property. You got to pay for the water service. If it's a freestanding house, obviously you can get the tenant to pay for the water, the electricity, and the gas. But you got to pay for for most of the holding costs associated with it, stamp duty connected with it, the insurance, um, and all and sundry council rates. You can't pass on all these things. So this is one of the main benefits of, of commercial property because it is largely a lot cleaner. The the rent you get is pretty much what goes in your back pocket, less than the mortgage, right? Yeah, and and that's why like earlier on I was saying I like the idea of having like more larger commercial versus lots of small residential because mm. imagine all the paperwork even for a small house you've got your rates, water, building insurance, landlord insurance, your rental management costs, uh, potentially land tax. Like there's a lot of invoices there. Yes, you can get your rental manager to look after them, but with commercial, it's really just your mortgage in many cases. Even land tax is often passed on to your tenant mm. for a single holding basis. So. It's a lot cleaner. There's a lot less touch points, and um, that's why I think it's more scalable because you can, you know, it, there's just less to do, really. What's your views? And this is a question from me rather than one of our listeners. Preference towards sort of multi-tenanted commercial assets versus single-tenanted commercial assets. So there's a lot more orchestration required if you have more than one tenant because you've got to start looking at percentage of, you know, oh, you, you've got 27% of it, you've got 37% of it. It gets a bit more complicated. What, what's, what's your preference? Look, personally, I, I used to like the multi-tenant the most, but it's case by case. If you're an investor and you've got 10 properties already, maybe just one single good quality asset with a multinational tenant's better because you've got your 10 other residentials. Diversification. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to go buy it six row of shops yeah. if you've got all those properties because then you're creating six more problems uh, and, you know, one tenant might leave and you've got the other five. That's a good thing. That probably will benefit you more if you've just got that property, nothing else, mm-hmm. you know, because you wouldn't want to buy a $1.5 million asset with no other assets to your name and then that tenant leaves. However, there are exceptions to that. What if you've got a good business and you don't care, you know, because it's a great location and it, you might be three months in between tenants. So the risk is not that great. Sometimes just better quality tenants can outweigh multiple smaller ones, but it's yeah, it's individual preference. I think there's no right or wrong way. It's just I think you just got to keep quality. That's the key. Like if you go multi-tenant, don't go six terrible quality small tenants just because you need six tenants. That that's going to just create problems. And you see it all the time, and you know you would have driven down streets and you see like a a row of shops with six people in it, and two of them have tenants, and four of them don't. You just go. That must suck, right, this perception thing. In that sort of case, are you better off just getting people in there, at least play the outgoings of the place with next to nothing rent? This is where incentives really come into play, just to fill it up, right? So that would be a – I guess the question is around how much does perception of the asset based on whether you've got tenants or not uh, have a direct correlation to the value of it? It's probably pretty important, right? Yeah, look, it's – and different asset classes are different. Like I find industrial has a very strong owner-occupier market. Mm. Retail, not so much. So a retail, vacant retail property might lose more value than a vacant industrial because um, right now with interest rates cheap, like vacant commercial industrial properties can be the same value as a tenanted one. In mm. some cases, I've seen them worth more because the owner-occupier market's so strong. But if you've got a, a small office space in the CBD now, in an old building, you definitely want a tenant in that because there's big strata costs yeah. in those ones. So it's really just down to the numbers on the property and the type of asset. But yeah, generally it's always worth more with a tenant in there. But if you do lose your tenant, you don't honestly you just got to hold on and then work the marketing campaign, get a new tenant in. So you might lose value on paper while they haven't lost while the tenant's not there. But as soon as you've got a new one, 
you might land a five-year lease instantly. It recalibrates the value, does it? That day. As soon as that lease is there, it's back to normal. Interesting, isn't it? So you, you just so got to- It's not necessarily the case with resi property, right? Like if, you, if it's untenanted, it doesn't lose its value. No, and, and that's a difference, yeah, because mm. resi- residential's got, yeah, there's no real value with the tenant. It's, uh, if anything, it could trap your owner-occupier market from buying your property. So yeah. sometimes it's better to sell vacant. Mm. Well, some good uh, questions and answers there. The answers are good. Thank you, Scott. Uh, some of them from me, but uh, uh, please keep them coming. Uh, info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. We'll do this uh, more often and, and they're coming in. So it's good, Scott, that we what we're doing is resonating. And, uh, and back to Jesse, thanks for the, the warm sentiments around what we're trying to do with uh, Inside Commercial Property. I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's a great journey, I think, for all investors to just expand their mindset towards commercial if they're sort of stuck in that residential pattern right now. And I think there's probably a natural advancement for all residential investors. They get there eventually, right? Have you ever heard of many sort of large-scale residential investors going, nah, never going to touch commercial? Or they normally just say, what have I been doing for the last four or five properties I should have been buying commercial? Yeah, it's it's not – like, and education's mm. changing that. So I think, you know, most people I talk to have a, an established residential property portfolio. And, uh, yeah, there's no real barriers. It was just the lack of understanding of it in the first place. So, mm. uh, And this is where this podcast is good because we're just telling – you know, we're talking about the market or the basics and – it's not that out of reach for people, and once you realise that, it becomes more attractive. Yeah, well, one of those um, tactics around is these lease stock loans. Uh, Scott, so we're recording this uh, late uh, November, and we're sort of getting up into into the summer season, which I think uh, a lot of people are looking forward to, maybe uh, clocking off for a little while and, and, and spending some time with family. What 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 will the best commercial investors be doing over this summer period, do you think, and, and, and what should you be doing to make sure uh, uh, come 2021 you're at best position to capitalise? I'd uh, probably just start the chats with your bank. Um, I think you always should casually look at properties over the break um, because people still need to sell. Um, if you wait till say February, where the market's flying normally, mm. you know there's the most amount of buyers we find at that uh, point of time. But January is quiet, and if you are actively looking in that space, like there's not many listings, a lot of agents are away, so there's you know not much could happen, but. If you, uh, if you do casually look at property, you might pick up a, a better deal than you would the month later when there's more competition. So I've always looked at this period, you know, point in time and, yeah, you don't put a huge amount of hours. Take some time off if you can, mm. but, you know, it may pay, it pay off. Good counsel. Uh, Scott, thanks uh, thanks for your time today. It was good. We like Q&As, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. What can people do if they've got any more questions for you? Can they get in touch? What's the best way? Yeah, so just – Probably Google Rethink Investing. You'll see a, a, a talk to us uh, tab in our website. So, um, or just info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Yeah, you're happy to chat. Eva, you, you, you're going to have some holidays or are you guys working through? Oh, I'll take two weeks off. Yeah, yeah. so that Chrissy New Year's bit. Yeah, yeah I think that's what we Definitely need it. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone needs a break this year. So, uh, But use that time. Listen to podcasts. I, I know a lot of people sit there drinking pina coladas on the beach and listen to the podcast. So it's one of the great things about this particular medium is that uh, no matter where you are, you can uh, be educating, uh, which is important. I hope you enjoyed that. Remember, info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. You can reach out directly to Scott and uh, meet with his team, have a chat or any questions at all, and we'll answer them on air. That's Inside Commercial Property for this month. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you.